Brethren, the presentation that I've taken from Solomon today is entitled The Five Noble Orders of Architecture. In summary, we look at the five periods of architectural history and put this information into perspective in considering the influence upon our ancient craft. The expression, the five noble orders of architecture, are familiar to all Freemasons, since we meet them in a very lengthy, complicated explanation as part of the fourth section of the second degree lecture, devoted to the fellow craft degree. William Preston, condensed an intelligent layman's knowledge of architecture into what we all know as the five orders of architecture. The Doric, the Ionic, the Corinthian, which were the Greek orders, followed by the Tuscan and the Composite, both orders devised by the Romans. It is only the first three orders that show invention and character, and essentially differ from each other. The last two have nothing original to offer. The Tuscan is the Doric in its earliest state. The composite is the Corinthian enriched with the Ionic. The term order refers not just to the column, but also to the details of the upper parts of the facades carried by the columns. Each order has its own conventions about the design of the continuous band of horizontal stonework carried by the columns called the entablature. This was just as important as the design of the column itself. According to the rules of classic architecture, the entablature is divided into three horizontal sections. The top band is a projecting section called the cornice. The next comes a single, deep, horizontal band called the frieze. Then between the base of the frieze and the column capitals are one or more horizontal bands called the architrave. The most complete architectural textbook to have survived from classical times is the one written by Marcus Vitruvius Pollio, better known simply as Vitruvius. He was an architect of some renown of the first century BCE, who is employed by Julius Caesar. His popular treatise was called the Ten Books on Architecture, which he dedicated to the Emperor Augustus, in which he described the use of various orders, showing how the term order covers more than just the style of the column. It is probable that this treatise provided important guidance during the Middle Ages. It is also a fair assumption that it was the point of reference for William Preston during the time of his research. What seems incomprehensible to the modern Masonic historian is the fact that he admitted what was at this time regarded to be the mother of speculative Freemasonry, the Gothic order of architecture. Gothic architecture was developed very quickly in the latter half of the 12th century. That remarkably coincides, give or take a hundred years, with the era of the Regius manuscript. This is so important from an historical perspective when we remember that the originators of Gothic architecture were the operative masons, the cathedral builders of the Middle Ages. Today, no architect divides his subject into five orders and the names attached to the different orders are no longer labels for the various schools of architecture. In place of the five orders of the Prestonian lecture, modern students actually see five great periods of architecture, not as separate and distinct inventions or designs, but rather as a school of life and times of those who built in ages past. These five periods may be labelled in several ways, the commonest being the Egyptian, Greek, Roman, Gothic and modern. Though looking back into history, there are, of course, others such as the Byzantine, Russian, Oriental and Spanish. Without detracting from the achievements of William Preston, let us take a quick look at these five periods of architectural history and put this information into perspective in considering the influence upon our ancient craft. Let us go right back into early history. 
Egyptian buildings go back to an early age, and Egyptian chronology places the proto-dynastic period from 6,000 to 3,200 BCE, some 8,000 years ago. It was not until the Old Kingdom Fourth Dynasty that the famous pyramids of Egypt were built at Giza. Put into historical perspective, this was at least 2,000 years before the Greek development of the classic orders that has featured so prominently in our Masonic lectures. The ancient Egyptians built their pyramids, tombs, temples and palaces out of stone, the most durable of materials, although many domestic buildings of little consequence were built from mud bricks. Although earthquakes, wars and the forces of nature have taken their toll, the remains of Egypt's monumental architectural achievements are still visible across the land, a tribute to the greatness of the civilization. Less well known than the pyramids is the temple at Karnak, built between 2000 and 2200 BCE. It contains what is known as the Hypostyle Hall, considered to be one of the world's greatest architectural masterpieces. It consists of stone columns supporting the roof, 82 feet high. The reliefs throughout the hall contain symbolism of the creation. Lying directly across the Nile from Karnak is one of the most dramatically situated temples in the world, the Mortuary Temple of Queen Hasheshput. Built in the 18th dynasty, 1490 to 1468 BCE, it is set at the head of a valley overshadowed by the peak of Mount Thebes, where a tree-lined avenue of sphinxes leads up to the temple with its imposing stone colonnades and terraces. Egyptian architecture was post and lintel the same principle as a goalpost or a modern door opening. The stone used was relatively soft and would have been easily crushed by the weight above. Hence, their walls were very thick and columns were heavy and large. The design of the sides of temples was raked, such that the bottom of the walls were thicker than the top. This created the illusion of solid permanency and what is described as magnificent repose. In contrast, the architecture of Greece was set in a different terrain, with mountains deeply cut into by the sea, a temperate and invigorating climate, set in the clear blue sky and the Mediterranean, in comparison with Egypt, hot, dry and almost mountainous, in which there was limitless availability of a wonderful raw material, marble. It enabled the creation of a graceful, flowing style, an exhilarating school which reflected the life, colour and culture of a people, music-loving, drama-conscious and idealistic in thought. Architects the world over have agreed that the Parthenon, the temple of Athena, Parthenos, the Greek goddess of wisdom, built in the 5th century BCE, on the Acropolis in Athens, is an ideal combination of composition, setting, dignity and studied refinement of the Doric order. Adjacent to the Parthenon on the slopes of the Acropolis is a temple called the Eresthium, built between 421 and 405 BCE which included several shrines to various gods, including Poseidon, a striking example of the Ionic order. The Corinthian order, the most ornate of the classic orders of architecture, did not arrive until the 4th century BCE, and, surprising as it may seem, was made little use of by the Greeks. Perhaps the most notable structure was the Temple of Zeus at Athens, began in the 2nd century BCE, and completed by Emperor Hadrian in the 2nd century CE. Greek architecture, like that of Egypt, was based upon the post and lintel, but was greatly refined and much more delicate, perhaps due to the strength of their principal building material, marble. The principal 
of the arch has been known for thousands of years. Probably the first arch was the leaning together of two slabs of stone mutually supporting each other. The Egyptians and the Greeks had terrible trouble in controlling the lateral thrust created by the design of the arch, and therefore it remained for the Romans to perfect the use of the arch. This they did to a remarkable good effect by a combination of the arch with the post and lintel. The combination of these principles made greater spaces available without an interior forest of columns. It produced arcades, courtyards, baths and public buildings including the pretentious villa as that of Hadrian with a remarkable frontage seven miles long, a demonstration to the world of the greatness of Rome and its people. Whilst the Greeks confined themselves to single-storey structures such as the Parthenon, the Romans created an entirely different type of structure the most famous one being used for sporting events, requiring a large seating capacity, the Colosseum, built in Rome in 72 CE. It was four storeys high. The first storey was built in the Tuscan order, the second storey in the Ionic order, and the third and fourth storeys in the Corinthian order. However, the outstanding development of the Roman era was the extensive use of the vaulted construction for large, uninterrupted spaces in monumental public architecture. Such a building was the spectacular Parthenon, built in Rome from 118 to 35 CE. The interior is a perfect circle with a diameter and height exactly the same at 43 metres. To create this incredible vaulted roof, the walls are just over six metres thick, with seven inches niches featured with Corinthian columns. So there you have it. But what about this reference to Gothic architecture? When did it begin and what was its influence upon architectural Masonic history? The artists who created and practised this style we call Gothic would not have understood the meaning of the word. It was first used during the Italian Renaissance as a term of contempt. Vasari, a learned scholar representing the Church of Rome, is quoted as having said, Then arose new architects who, after the manner of their barbarous nations, erected buildings in that style which we call Gothic. The word itself in its present application is repugnant to any sense of exact thought. Gothic architecture emerged as far back as when Abbot Sugar built a new basilica in St. Denis, a suburb of Paris in 1136 to 1147. It embraced vaulted barrel arched roof design from which Gothic architecture developed very quickly to transform Western architecture and dominate Western architecture for the next 400 years. It was an expression to the aspirations of men who had only the background of the Dark Ages behind them. There was a need for something better, a love for religion, an urge to express the hope of the human heart. With it came ribbed vaults of stone, pointed arches, lofty and narrow windows with stained glass, complete with pointed steeples, the aspiring towers, and carvings and decorations carried heavenward by graceful lines of stone, which bade its parishioners to look up, ever up, in search for the Almighty. An extraordinary development which heralded the cathedral builders of the Middle Ages right across the whole of Europe. A much abbreviated summary of the examples of Gothic architecture are the Palace of Westminster, Canterbury, Durham, Exeter, Gloucester, Lincoln, Peterborough, Salisbury Cathedrals and York Minster. And in France, Chartres, Reims, Notre Dame, Girona and Milan in Italy, Toledo in Spain and Capitol Hill in Washington. Suffice it to say, it was in this architecture with this architecture, 
by this architecture that the builders who were ancestors of modern Freemasons worked and excelled from generation to generation. Brethren, that is the end of the presentation, but I would just like to draw your attention to using Solomon. If you look up this particular presentation on Solomon, you'll see some interesting photographs and uh, uh, designs that uh, will put this entirely into context for you. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, brethren. Thank you for your very kind attention.